How are sprint car shocks made and why are they the most important part on the car? Getting your shocks adjusted just right is a vastly underrated, skillful art that only the best within the industry know how to do. In comparison to other forms of motorsport, sprint cars have long remained very simple machines. But with dynamometers and associated software now readily available, competitors now have access to knowing everything about their shocks. In turn, the standard of shock technology and performance within the sport has been raised. The days of buying a shock with a single digit stamped on top and bolting it on your car are long gone. While some formerly prominent brands have faded into obscurity, others have stepped up to the challenge of dirt racing's specific tuning needs. To show you what's inside a shock and how they're manufactured and all of the effort that goes into them, I needed access. Access that Garrett Andrews, the owner and founder of Competition Suspension Inc, also known as CSI, was kind enough to give me. And I had no idea just how much they actually built, even outside of sprint car racing. So we do everything from design to manufacture, uh, shock absorbers, all the accessories, bump rubber cups, coil kits for a very niche market, um, quarter midgets, micro sprints, midget sprint car silver crown is kind of um, our core market. The sprint car fan in me geeked out big time because when I walked into their facility, Garrett gave me a personal tour with zero restrictions. All to show you all of the parts and every single step of the process. And there's roughly 40 pieces that go inside of a shock. So these are kind of the components that make up a shock absorber. So the main body, this has a, a mirror-like burnish finish because uh, on a monotube shock, the piston actually rides up and down on the inside of this. So the finish inside that body has to be just perfect. Um, a rod end, this is an assembly, so there's a handful of parts that go in here. Um, the adjuster knob, there's a check ball and a spring to give you a detent so you can feel the clicks in your shock. The spherical bearing and clip, the rod guide that uh, supports the shaft in the body. So this would screw into the body and then the shaft goes through that. Uh, several parts to that, um, a bushing a seal and a wiper, um, then some O-rings and then a bleed screw for us to bleed the air out of the shock when we're building it. The main shaft and on, on an adjustable shock, these are always hollow because we have what's called a metering rod that goes inside of that shaft. And as you uh, adjust your shock, it, that metering rod pushes a needle uh, against this jet. And this is a rebound jet. There's also a compression jet, depending on whether we want to adjust compression or rebound or on a double adjustable, it gets a little more complicated, but that needle, we have a variety of different um, degree ends on it, depending on how broad we want the adjustment range to be. So that would go in the shaft, and then your jet would go in the shaft. On the shaft would go uh, a piston with a series of shims. I don't have the shims laid out, but there'd be shims on both sides of the piston. And then a uh, piston nut that would hold that piston tight on the shaft. At the end of the the body, um, it would have a, a base valve of some sort. So this is another assembly. So we have the base valve. Um, you can see a shim stack on there and then a bolt and a nut that holds all that tight on the base valve. And then on top of the base valve would be the divider piston. Um, the divider piston goes inside of the body cap and that keeps the oil and the nitrogen separate from each other inside of the shock. And kind of the last piece is the body cap. So a uh, Schrader valve where you would charge it with nitrogen to a specific pressure, um, the aluminum housing, the bearing, and the clip. So these are kind of all the pieces that would go in a, a pretty typical monotube shock that's used on a sprint car. It really is incredible that every single part that he just showed us are all designed and manufactured right there in-house at that CSI factory, which for a variety of reasons are made from a range of materials. Pretty much everything we make from the body standpoint is aluminum. It's lighter, it dissipates heat better. Um, a lot of the internals are made out of aluminum, but we also have some stuff made out of stainless. Um, and then our shafts are made of a different material just to be stronger. Um, and, and we have that kind of famous CSI gold coating on the shaft, which is a friction reducer, also hardens the shaft from like rock chips and stuff. Just because they can make a nice piece doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to do its job well. That's where these guys really do their work, creating not just valving for their shocks, but doing proper research and development 
creating brand new products for the industry. Tuning shocks has evolved so much since we started in 2009. At that time, everybody just took a boxed shock off the shelf and put it on their car and ran with it. Um, now everything is really customized for the end user. Um, how the guy drives the race car, how much the driver weighs, um, how their setup works. So each shock package is really custom tailored for the end user. And that's almost all the way down to the local racer now is getting some type of customized shock package um, for their specific application. As customers are racing throughout the year and we're at races with them supporting um, there's times where we identify maybe a certain handling characteristic that we're trying to, um, a problem we're trying to solve and we need to uh, maybe make the car smoother on a cushion or we feel like maybe we're lacking for grip and rough track scenarios. <clears throat> then we'll sit down with um, our engineering team and uh, identify what that part is we need to make. For example, at one point this summer we felt like Maybe our customers weren't getting through uh, rough scenarios as good as some of our competitors. So we started identifying on the dyno running shocks at different velocities. Um, we have a full data acquisition system. So looking at that data and seeing is there anything that stands out why uh, we're maybe not getting across a rough part of the track as good as our competitors. Once we can identify that spot in the shock curve, then we can start to look at how we're going to make a part, whether we want to flow more, flow less, more preload in the shim stack, um, however we want to solve that issue. And sometimes we have to make the part two or three times to get it exactly how we want on the dyno before we'll even put it on the racetrack and then get um, driver feedback uh, to see if we've went the right direction and we've solved that issue. The amount of effort that goes into getting a driver comfortable in their race car is truly underappreciated. You can design a part, but then you've also got to design or create a way to actually manufacture that part. Braden will then write the program that will go to the machine to uh, tell the machine how to make the part. So you can see he's got the solid model and then he creates tool paths um, selects what tools he wants to use to make the part, and then it <clears throat> would generate uh, a program. You know, it looks like it's 7,800 lines of code to actually make this one base valve. Every line of code is a movement in the machine. Basically, that code tells the machine how to make the part. Almost 8,000 lines of code just to machine one part. As Garrett told us, there's about 40 parts that make up a single shock absorber. It blows my mind to see what all of these parts start out as. No wonder there are 16 people that make up the two shifts at CSI. How many shocks do they produce in a year? Well, keep watching. Once we design the part, wrote the program, we'll identify what material we want to make it out of. Most all of our billet pieces we make out of 7075. This is all uh, USA source material. So we'll order in sticks of material cut them to length. Typically for the lathe, we cut them to four foot sections. And if it's a bar fed part, that's the, the correct length. Or even if it's not, that's perfectly what'll fit in the back of the machine. And then we'll just make a bunch of these pieces out of this giant stick of material. Yeah, we'll just make a bunch of these incredible, highly specific, identical, beautiful pieces, right? This next part, I love seeing the most. CSI has not held back from investing in the best CNC equipment. CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control, meaning that the program that's written on the computer then tells the machine and its tools to move in a certain way to create a part. We have the raw material in the machine. Um, the operator has loaded the, the turret here with all of the tools we need to make this part. So there's quite a few tools. Um, this particular lathe, we can machine on both sides, so it'll machine the front side of this. The sub spindle will grab it, and then we'll machine all the backside work, and this part actually comes off complete in one operation. We made the investment in these higher-end lathes that can do turning, milling um, on both sides because previous to that, we would just turn a puck and then take it to our mill and mill the part, flip it, mill the part, and every time you have to have another operation, there's a chance for a slight inconsistency. And in the shock parts, the more consistent they are, the easier it is for the builders to build the shock and the better it is for the end user because we can make like two virtually identical shocks. The tuning's a lot more precise because in a shock, as I mentioned earlier, there's like almost 40 pieces and there's tolerances on every part. 
And so every little piece can make the shock slightly different. So the more consistent we can make all those parts, the better the end, end product is. I really did not expect to see this next piece. While some external parts are fine to be deburred by hand, it's imperative that the internals like a piston or a base valve are produced exactly to the tiniest of tolerances. And while this next machine was definitely not designed for shock parts, it does go to show you the meticulous levels that CSI goes to to produce a quality product. So this machine's for polishing jewelry and it actually, um, it spins and it's got, uh, it's got all these tiny little stainless steel pins that it spins around the part. And we use that to deburr all these little holes. So the part just comes out and looks like polished jewelry. It's a really slick, uh, slick process we have to make our pistons and everything deburred and just perfect. Once the parts are made, some are sent off to look pretty where they are anodized or coated, depending on what they are. They'll then come back have final tolerance inspections made, and then they're ready for assembly. We have five assembly bays here. Um, <clears throat> and really that's because we have like somebody who specializes in building our quarter midget shocks, someone who specializes in building our micro shocks, our sprint car shocks, and then uh, someone who does repairs. So we like one shock technician to do the job start to finish. So if the guy is building sprint car shocks, he'll pull all the parts and build the shock start to finish. Um, and then that way he owns the project. He's very familiar with it because he's building sprint car shocks every day. So uh, this is one of our five bays. We try to keep all the tools the guy will need in his bay. Every bay's got uh, a dyno. We use CTW dynos here. And then um, all of the data is saved to a hard drive and then backed up to the cloud. So we always can get uh, shock dyno data for our customers. We get, oftentimes somebody will buy a a used shock and they don't know anything about it, we can look up via the serial number, get them the last time it was serviced and the most latest dyno information. CSI builds around about five to 6,000 brand new shocks every single year. And on top of that, they rebuild and service about the same amount. That's a lot of tuning. So when you hear somebody talk about the valving inside your shock, this is basically what it is. So piston, they come in all types of shapes and sizes, different amounts of flow and different degrees of preload shim stacks so we make all of the parts other than the shims and the seals um, on the shims we buy a real high quality sandvik material um, that's stamped it's very robust and built for all of the flexing that you're going to see um, these shims actually bend and open and let fluid bleed past the piston and that's how you get the dampening curve of your shock um, so these all these components are what build the actual valving in your shock to get you a certain force on compression and rebound. If you like this, there's so much more to learn about spring car racing. So make sure you watch one of these videos next and do not forget to grab your spring car hub merch.